<laughs> oh my god, that never, ever gets old. Okay, so obviously that was exaggerated. While the reality might look a little boring, the feeling you get from driving this car, car is absolutely pure joy. I haven't been able to conduct a true zero to 60 speed test, but based on all other all wheel drive owners, they've been able to get speeds around 4.3 seconds from zero to 60, which is about half a second faster than the real wheel drive versions. But it's over one second slower than the performance model. If you watched my previous video on my delivery experience, you know that I had kind of a rocky experience getting this car, but post delivery, the actual ownership of this car and driving it has been absolutely exceptional. Driving with all the default settings, it handles like a responsive sports car. The steering is taut, but not overly so. You'll find yourself feeling comfortable taking quick turns and quick corners because you always feel a connection to the ground. And as you saw from my opening, the acceleration and <laughs> power is just pure fun. Uh, the shocks on this car aren't as firm as the earlier versions. I have no complaints whatsoever about the comfort of the ride. There's a nice balance between being able to feel the road and judge the conditions of how you can push the car and comfort in being able to enjoy longer road trips and not get fatigued. In my first two weeks, I've been averaging about a 245 watt hour per mile, which is about a 95% efficiency uh, compared to the rated range. A few of my drives have been pretty bad for efficiency because I've been a little more energetic in my driving with quick acceleration and kind of having fun with the car. Uh, but as I get more settled down into my usual mode of driving and get used to driving an EV, um, I'm sure that that water mile will improve. From other users on places like the Tesla's Motor Club forums, people are reporting that they're getting about a 230 watt hour mile on the all wheel drive compared to the rear wheel drive. Uh, but that's a like apples and oranges comparisons because there's so many factors that play into that. Weather, incline, I'm going up a hill right now, uh, how your driving is, whether you have the aero wheels on or not, what your tire pressure is, all of those things play into the, the drive and the uh, watt hour miles you'll get on your car. The first thing that strikes you when you get into this car is the minimalist design. And as a UI designer, I know it's difficult to pull that off and not have it feel like it's incomplete or cheap. And this car does not feel cheap or incomplete. It feels thoroughly finished. It's quite an achievement in design to pull this off, but it's not going to be for everybody. Some people like more ornate design with lots of levels, angles, buttons, knobs. You're obviously not going to get that here. So if that's your taste, you're gonna to have to look elsewhere. But for me, this is right up my alley. The single wood panel is absolutely gorgeous. It, it adds just the right amount of texture and warmth to the cabin. The Alcantara panels on the doors, they're beautiful and they feel like really, really high end. And I was worried about how it would take to the single screen in the center console with your speedometer on the left-hand panel here. Uh, but it, I don't know if it's all the videos that I watched before I picked up my car, but I took to this like right away. Like there was no delay in me getting used to just glancing down into the right instead of having to look through the steering wheel for my speed. It was, it felt very natural within minutes of driving the car. Now I could not say the same thing about the accelerator pedal and the regenerative braking. You'll have to watch my other video on my delivery experience for that story, but it took me a little bit to get used to that. <laughs> There are a lot more positives on this car than negatives, and the negatives are fairly minor, but here's a quick rundown of the positives. Acceleration and power. I mean, this car reacts almost as quickly as I can think of what I want it to do. I don't advocate for aggressive driving, or as we call it in Massachusetts, mass hole driving. That's not my style, but the incredible torque and instant power in acceleration comes with in handy when merging into traffic on the highway or when pulling out into a busy road from a side street. Build quality, I know there's been a lot of chatter online about spotty quality, but I don't see it at all in my car. It's rock solid. No more defects on this car than any other car I've purchased from Mazda, Ford, Nissan, or, or Volkswagen. Technology, it shouldn't be a surprise, but this car is kind of a dream gadget for a tech enthusiast like myself. It's a smartphone on wheels. Depending on who you are, that may actually sound kind of like a nightmare, but look at it this way. How many cars can you say actually get better with age? 
The way this car gets updates over the air is unheard of in the car industry. New features getting added over time or issues getting resolved. I mean, for free, without needing to go into a service center. For instance, autopilot improvements and new features are constantly getting rolled out. When Consumer Reports couldn't list the Model 3 as a recommend uh, because of long braking distances, Tesla figured out the problem and released an anti-lock brake update and resolved the issue. And Consumer Reports now lists the car as recommended. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. Autopilot and cruise control. Yes, there are lots of reports about Teslas having accidents while drivers were using autopilot. But nine times out of 10, it's driver error. People are misusing autopilot, which is a driver assist feature, not actual self-driving. Someone watching a movie while using autopilot is really asking for problems. I mean, autopilot is going to help you avoid accidents, but this isn't getting covered as much in the media because it's not as attention grabbing as a car crash. My initial experience with autopilot was a little bit of this. Put me back for me controlling. Oh dear Jesus, I could never, ah, ah. Oh, where's it going? But after I got past that, it's been amazing, especially in rush hour type traffic. If you're not in an area where autopilot works, adaptive cruise control is still amazing. And I know that's on a lot of cars, but this is my first car that's actually had it. And not having to ride the pedal for stop and go traffic is spectacular. This car is one of the safest cars you can buy today with autopilot, helping to avoid accidents and seeing things that you may have missed. Not to mention the five-star rating it just received in all categories from the NHTCA. Storage space, I mean, come on, just look at how much storage space you have in this thing. I went from a Ford Fusion Energy, which had what I would call a toy trunk compared to this, or compared to any car, actually. There's even trunk space in the trunk space. It's the rushing nesting doll of trunks. Seats, these are some of the most comfortable car seats I've ever used. They offer just the right shape and padding and cushion for my tastes. In the premium package, they have adjustments for height, tilt, distance, and lumbar cushion placement and size. And the back seat is surprisingly roomy and comfortable as well. The sound system. I'm not sure I'd call myself an audiophile, but I have deep appreciation for good audio and have a background in audio design and production from my college and grad school days. The Model 3 has one of the best sound systems that I've ever heard in a car. The 12 speaker sound stage is immersive and it's hard to tell exactly where the sound is coming from. It's also super well balanced. There's a healthy amount of bass without being boomy, making things sound muddy. And the high end is super clear without being harsh or shrill. And not that I recommend this if you value your hearing, but it doesn't distort as you get into upper levels of volume. It's absolutely sublime. It was not something I was expecting when I ordered the car. I wish I could convey the sound over YouTube, but that's just not possible. Voice controls. At the moment, you can only use the controls for setting navigation destinations, placing or answering calls, but Elon has said additional functionality is coming where you'll be able to control other functionality of the car, something like your wipers. The system picks up your voice really well over the traffic noise, and it's very quick to respond. Unlike some other voice assistants that I know, Siri says hi. And speaking of Siri, I've been pleasantly surprised how well she works in the car too. She's able to pick up my voice very well from my phone in the phone dock, and once she starts to respond, it behaves like a phone call on the entertainment system. She'll hear you over the microphones and you'll hear her over the car stereo. It's no car play, but it's kind of great. So what about the negatives? Well, the rear window, it does not have good sight lines. It's pretty, pretty small. You really can only see the drivers behind you from their head up which makes it a slightly unnerving experience if you're trying to gauge how close a car is behind you and if they're paying attention. The counter to this could be that you really have a good rear view camera that you can pull up at any time with one tap on the center console. I find the camera to be good enough and it offers enough detail that you can be confident in using it. And that's not something I could say for my wife's Mazda or my Ford Fusion, which had a very small grainy little screen. Technology. Yes, I included this in the positive list, but it's a double-edged sword. I've had the computer that drives the display once in the past two weeks, only once, but it have it crash and reboot, and it blacks out the screen for five to seconds while it's rebooting. It doesn't affect the operation of the car, but it's a little alarming when it happens for the first time. It's possible that a software update that they push out could introduce, introduce a new bug, or it could bomb out in the middle of an update, which could potentially require a service center visit to fix. The negative is pretty minor in my book, but it is something to think about. Technology like this can sometimes have quirks. Phone for entry. Now to be clear, I'm actually loving my phone as my key. It's been rock solid and has worked 100% of the time, 
but I've heard enough stories online and from others that it's kind of hit and miss. It sounds like Android phone users have a tougher time than iPhone users, and I'm an iPhone 10 user myself, and it works flawlessly. So I just want to call this out as it's a potential negative and your mileage will vary. The key card. Again, I love that I have a credit card sized key tucked away in my wallet, not taking up much space that works as a backup key in case my phone key doesn't work for some reason. However, it's such a different and unique form of entry that I hate having to explain to someone how to use it. In my previous job, I had to use valet parking and there were a lot of random valets that would work there. So it would mean having to have a whole lot of conversations about here's how you lock and unlock the car. I'm all for pushing design forward, but I'm not a fan of how crazy different the system works from a traditional key or key fob, that it becomes completely unintuitive. Please give me a real key fob. It will be one less thing I have to explain to someone if they I have to hand out my key. And thankfully a key fob is coming and I will be getting one, but only plan to use that for valets or friends and family. I'm gonna stick with the phone and the backup key card in my wallet. The door handles. I'm not talking about the suicide style exterior handle. Those aren't that difficult. I mean, you can show somebody pretty easily how to use it or let them discover it for themselves. That's pretty simple. But the inside door, this guy right here, it's not good. If you have someone unfamiliar with a Model 3 in the car and don't explain how to get out, they will most likely pull the emergency release. People are used to levers for getting out of a car and when they see something that they can pull, they'll pull it. A tiny nondescript button that's located at the top of the door handle isn't the first thing you'd consider. Oftentimes you'll have mirror adjustments up there or sometimes window controls, but a button for opening a car door? Nope. I get why the emergency release has to be obvious in case of emergency, but the button should have been even more obvious. What really kills me is that if you pull the emergency lever, the car yells at you that using the lever can damage your car. When you open the door on the Model 3, the windows go down slightly to clear the seal and the aluminum trim. If you use the emergency open, the windows don't go down and it can potentially cause damage and alignment issues. That raises the question that maybe Tesla should have stuck with a frame around the door to avoid the issue completely, or again, made the button super obvious. For people using the car on a daily basis, this won't be an issue at all. It's only for those new Tesla Model 3 riders. Streaming radio services like Slacker Radio kind of suck. There's no way around it. Some of the streaming sources have very limited bandwidth and because of the great sound system, it's pretty obvious because you can hear all the audio compression from the stream. It's a real shame. And from what I understand, you can get better bit rates from Slacker if you have a paid subscription, but as it is out of the box, it's lackluster. Streaming from my phone, the audio quality is much, much better and playing off a USB stick sounds even better still. However, there are some quirks with the album art if you're using a podcast player from your phone, for some reason, it will either show no art or random art from uh, some musical album. It's kind of funny. I put all of those negatives as pretty minor issues. They're really super, super nitpicky and don't mar the overall quality and enjoyment of my Model 3. There are a few miscellaneous items that don't fall into the positive or negative bucket, but more of a, the more you know kind of thing. Screen controls. A lot of people that actually haven't driven the car complain about this. In practice, it's not anywhere that bad. In fact, it's not that bad at all. It's just different. To open the glove box requires two taps. To adjust your wiper speed isn't even a tap, it's really just a swipe. When you manually activate the wipers on the left stock, the wiper controls will automatically slide out on the screen and then all you have to do is swipe and adjust the speed if you want to. The same is true for the vents. You have to move some little dots around the screen to adjust how you'd like your air direction to go. But I haven't needed to adjust it ever since my initial setup of the car. In fact, I don't think I ever adjusted my vents on my Ford Fusion after my initial setup. I found most of the things that you do in the car are controlled with the stocks or the steering wheel buttons. For the slightly less common, but still needed controls, it's just one tap. You hit the little car icon on the lower left and all the quick controls pop up on the right-hand side of the screen. If you start going deeper than that, you're starting to get into uncommon adjustments and shouldn't probably be driving while playing around with those anyway. It might take an adjustment period for some folks, but I don't have any issues with the screen controls for everything type of design. The center console is also a fingerprint magnet. The piano glossy black surface looks great, but it's not forgiving when it comes to dust and fingerprints. So I ended up getting a matte black vinyl wrap from Abstract Ocean, which actually blends really well with the color and texture of the leather of the car. If this isn't your taste, you can pick up anything from brushed metal to carbon fiber 
or even just glossy black. Abstract Ocean has quite a few great looking options and they're relatively easy to stall. It's a pretty forgiving material to work with and just takes a little patience. And if you screw up a piece, Abstract Ocean will actually send you a free replacement for that first piece you screw up. I actually reached out to Abstract Ocean and got a discount code for anybody that's interested. You'll get 15% off your order if you use my affiliate link, which also helps support the channel. I'm planning on getting some more of their replacement LED lights to increase the brightness of the glove box as well as the trunk, because those lights are kind of dim. They have a lot of great Tesla mods available, so be sure to check, check out Abstract Ocean. Beware of third-party integrations. I'm going to be doing a more in-depth video on integrations with things like Siri, Amazon Echo, Google home automation routines, other services to help you track your energy usage and your charging and how your battery health is. And if you aren't careful, some of these services can cause a lot of phantom drain. When I first started playing with some of these services, like a few days after I got my car, I installed Teslab, Home Assistant's Tesla component, the Remote S app, and I was seeing 18 to 20 miles of range lost every day on my car just sitting idle in the garage. After resetting everything, I got the phantom drain back to a normal one to two miles a day. So beware, you've been warned. I'll be making a video with some of what I found as safe and useful in a future video. Wireless phone charging. In this day and age, they should have included a Qi charger in the center console for your phone, but thankfully it's easily fixed with a third-party add-on like the Jetta wireless pad, and there's a few others as well. I have one on order and I'll be making a video on that later. Was the car worth the 894 day wait? I'd say absolutely. This is the best car that I've ever owned and it's hard to not get a smile on your face when you drive it. It's built like a tank, drives like a sports car, and is one of the safest cars on the road. Is the all-wheel drive Model 3 worth the premium price of fifty dollars to $60,000? I'd say yes. It's an eye-popping amount of money to pay for a car, but what you're getting for the money feels like it's all there. The all-wheel drive dual motor is going to come in handy, very handy, in the New England winters, and offers a nice extra boost in the speed department. It's cheaper to operate than gas and has a much smaller carbon footprint too over the life of the car. When the $35,000 base model becomes available ne early next year, it's gonna be an absolute steal. This is a car that's designed for the mass market and will send shockwaves to the auto industry once Tesla is producing them at full speed. Range anxiety should not be an issue with 300 plus miles on the long range and all wheel drive versions of the car. And even the base model will get over 200 miles, which will be more than enough for commuting. Add to that the Tesla supercharging network, which has over 10,000 chargers around the world. And Elon Musk stated that 99% of US population is within 150 miles of a supercharger. Range anxiety is a thing of the past. The all-wheel drive Model 3 is an absolutely amazing car. By the time this is published, I'll be on my first 400 to 500 mile EV road trip with my Model 3. I'll be capturing the trip and my experiences and be sharing those very soon, hopefully next week or the week after, depending on how my schedule works out. Comment down below if you have any questions when it comes to EVs and range. Let me know if there, you have any questions or things you'd like to see answered that I didn't cover already in this video, or if you'd like me to dig deeper on any of the topics. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Stay tuned for my future videos on the EV road trip, Tesla integrations, and other tech reviews. And to not miss an episode, be sure to subscribe and hit the little notification bell. And as I mentioned earlier, check out Abstract Ocean for some great Tesla add-ons like the center console wrap, they have screen protectors, light mods, and more. If you use my affiliate link, you'll get 15% off your order and help the channel. The same is true for my Amazon links in the description below too. Any purchase you make after you follow those links will also help support the channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.